Good evening again. This is Steve Huntings, the Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas. I'm watching our numbers and they seem to have leveled off about 70 or 75 participants, so this is probably a good time for us to get started. Thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. Great thanks to my dear friend, Professor Alejandro Baer of the University of Minnesota and the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Oh, it's a pleasure, Alejandro, to partner with you. I want to say good evening on behalf of my JCRC colleagues, uh, Laura Zell and Susie Greenberg, too. The shadow of the Kristallnacht is long, even exactly 82 years later tonight, in November 1938. We have now, we've organized an Upper Midwest Consortium for Holocaust and Genocide Education and Research. I appreciate that's a mouthful, but we're trying to accomplish much that is good in the world of Holocaust education. We have many colleges. We can recite a long list of wonderful institutions in the Upper Midwest who are participating. Churches, uh, Minnesota National Guard, uh, JCRC, museums, cultural institutions, all people who have a desire to advance Holocaust and genocide education throughout the Upper Midwest. And I hope if you're not part of our group, you'll consider joining it. What do we do? We share resources, best practices, programs like tonight's total devastation, the forgotten mass destruction of Jewish homes during the Kristallnacht. And we're here to provide resources and assistance and exchange ideas and all things that will help strengthen Holocaust and genocide education throughout our community. We look back, destruction of the second temple and how did Judaism survive? It survived because it evolved, it changed, it transformed ways it changed and transformed is in a way it decentralized. The center of Judaism became the synagogue and the home. So it was particularly diabolical at the Kristallnacht that the Nazis first targeted the synagogues. As you can see this two volume set, if you can see it well, which chronicles the destruction of over 1300 Jewish, over 1300 Jewish prayer halls and synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. But tonight we're gonna to learn something a different chapter, you might say, and that is the destruction of homes. Remember, we talked about synagogues and homes as the basis for a decentralized Judaism. Well, tonight we're going to learn from Professor Wolf Gruner about the destruction of the Jewish homes and apartments and places of uh, living and abode and how that impacted uh, the Kristallnacht and ultimately the unfolding of the Shoah. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Professor Gruner, to Minnesota virtually. I hope someday you'll come and visit us. Uh, in the flesh, you would say, when public health will allow. And now it's my pleasure, like any Jewish event, to turn it over to someone else to make the introduction of our speaker. And that is Professor Alejandro Baer. Alejandro, uh, thank you again for your partnership in these endeavors and for everybody that's partnering with us tonight. And please introduce Professor Gunnar. Alejandro, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to partner with uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council again uh, on uh, this important date, on this important uh, commemorative lecture. And um, I mentioned before, uh, when I was muted, that Professor Gruner has visited Minnesota um, oh physically, not just virtually, uh, in the past. So we hope to have you back again uh, uh, and when, when, when this situation, hopefully soon, is over. Uh, it's a pleasure to also to, to kick off uh, with this event and present the Minnesota Consortium for Holocaust and Genocide Education. And let me also uh, mention an event organized by Andy Tix, uh, Professor Andy Tix, uh, on November 17th, uh, how History, Communication Studies, Psychology and Law Approach Holocaust Studies. It's an event that is specifically directed towards educators and we thank Andy for his, um, for the coordination, for the efforts putting that together. And uh, uh, now let me introduce our, our, our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Wolf Gruner, who holds the uh, Chapel Gehring Chair in Jewish Studies. Uh, he's Professor of History at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, since 2008. 
and he's also the founding director, director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Uh, Professor Gruner is a specialist in the history of the Holocaust and in comparative genocide studies, and he serves on the academic committees of several organizations and journals, among them, I mentioned only some of them, the Academic Committee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem's International Institute for Holocaust Research, and the International Advisory Board of uh, the Journal of Genocide Research. Professor Gruner has authored uh, an impressive uh, number of uh, monographs and also other publications, and I will just mention the most recent ones, uh, which is um, uh, in June 2020, uh, recent work is the volume co-edited with Thomas Pegelo, Resisting Persecution, Jews and their petitions mm. during the Holocaust. And uh, last year, uh, another edited volume that uh, is very relevant uh, to tonight, which is titled mm. New Perspectives on Kristallnacht, After 80 Years, the Nazi Pogrom in Global Comparison. And it's a collection of essays uh, that discuss reactions to the pogrom by victims and witnesses inside Nazi Germany and also uh, by foreign journalists, diplomats and Jewish organizations. Uh, the chapter that uh, Wolf Gruner writes in, in that volume is, um, is uh, discusses the topic that he will present tonight, the project titled Total Devastation, the Forgotten Mass Destruction of Jewish homes during Kristana. Uh, Wolf, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you again for joining us and thank you everyone for connecting tonight. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Steve and Alejandro. It's really great to be back, although just virtually. <laughs> so, um, uh, and thank you for uh, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and also the kind of uh, connected institutions uh, who are hosting this uh, lecture. Um, let me bring up my PowerPoint. Oops. So, um, when we think about the topic of Kristallnacht, um, for many decades, scholars have perceived the event as one of the most and best investigated for the whole Third Reich. However, uh, today we have to recognize that our knowledge about what happened uh, during the night and the next day in Germany and Austria is still quite limited. When the program uh, in November of 1938 is discussed um, in the literature or even also in public media, Mostly um, the attacks on synagogues and shops across um, the Third Reich are emphasized. Only a few kind of websites or also um, scholarly works uh, put a little bit of emphasis on the destruction of uh, Jewish institutions like community buildings, schools and cemeteries. And much less uh, focus is on the demolition of private homes. Although during the last decade, the intrusion and destruction of private homes and rental apartments did appear occasionally in some scholarly accounts. And it was mainly based on um, evidence uh, from post-war trials or recompensation files. But uh, until now, there was no systematic analysis um, uh, available. Neither the scale or intensity of the attacks have been thoroughly investigated nor the impact on the Jewish population and their responses. So based on uh, new sources and revisiting old sources, uh, I will analyze in the following lecture, first, the scale of the uh, violence, secondly, the intensity, and finally, the impact of the mass uh, destruction of Jewish homes on the Jews themselves and how they reacted towards it. And what I want to do with the new evidence is really to establish this forgotten aspect um, as a basic element of the brutal assault on the Jews that we call Kristallnacht. So let me start with the scale of the mass destruction. Using uh, the pretext of the murder of a German diplomat in Paris, Hitler and Goebbels decided to use violence against the remaining Jews 
in uh, Nazi Germany with the uh, overall goal to drive them out of the country. For them, this policy shift uh, deemed necessary since the Nazi leadership already prepared for, the, for a war um, after the peaceful annexation um, of the Sudeten territories, peaceful in quotation marks. Um, they aimed already to occupy the remaining Czech and then also territories and also Poland. Images uh, usually illustrate the attacks onto the synagogues um, or kind of uh, the uh, destruction of Jewish shops in Germany. When we think about documents uh, who kind of reflect upon Kristallnacht and use uh, numbers, um, they never include the destruction of private homes. Usually docu Nazi documents are cited like the one from Reinhard Heydrich, the head of the security police, uh, who told high ranking Nazi leaders two days after the program that 177 synagogues, 7,500 stores had been demolished and 35 Jews had been murdered. Later, these numbers uh, were officially raised by the Nazis themselves to 276 destroyed synagogues uh, and 91 killed Jews. One document is usually not cited, which the same Reinhard Heydrich uh, already submitted one day after the program to Hermann Göring. And in this report, practically the first report, um, he mentions as usually the destruction of synagogues and stores, but also mentions 171 arsoned and demolished private Jewish houses. And moreover, Heydrich emphasized in this report that the actual numbers would be much higher than in his preliminary report. Today, most historians kind of estimate the, the number of demolished synagogues with over 2000 uh, the number of murdered Jews with several hundred, but we have no clue uh, about the damage done um, to private homes. The first indication about kind of the um, numbers and figures of destroyed homes might give a report by the president of the administrative district Schneidemühl, who noted that in his district, um, oops, this. In his district, the uh, stormtroopers destroyed 16 synagogues, 63 shops, but 231 apartments. New numbers from the city Nuremberg do confirm these surprising figures from a more rural area. For the city of Nuremberg, where the Franconian and uh, notorious Nazi party Gauleiter Julius Streicher told a mass meeting the day after the program that the demonstrations in his district were generally disciplined, clear and far-sighted. However, the reality was quite different. In his city, uh, several synagogues were destroyed, 70 shops, and again, 236 apartments. When we take the in, kind of surrounding regions uh, of Nuremberg and the neighboring city Fürth together, 600 apartments and homes were demolished. In Düsseldorf, which was in Western Germany, or is still in Western Germany, research showed that um, more than 400 uh, apartments and homes were destroyed. That means just in three cities uh, in one rural district, over 1,200 destroyed homes uh, can be, uh, there's evidence for more than 1,200 homes, destroyed homes. So when one pays attention to the attacks of private homes in the archives, um, but also in published documents, letters, and other uh, sources, evidence quickly emerges for practically every place in Germany, from Cologne, Duisburg, Bochum, Essen, Oberhausen, Königsberg, Leipzig, Chemnitz, Beuthen, Breslau, Hindenburg, and these are just a few. In Berlin, in the capital, young uniformed men burglarized countless apartments, especially in the northern and eastern part of the city. According to one survivor, quote, the beasts pushed their way into apartments, threw the furniture out of the windows and slit open the beds, end of quote. 
In Vienna, systematic raids led to the destruction of furniture, robbery of valuables, and various arsonings in 70% of the apartments, or uh, kind of uh, with the Jewish residents. The Jewish organization, the Joint, reported soon after the event that in Mannheim, 90% of all homes were destroyed, and in Rostock, in northern Germany, every Jewish home had been vandalized. From the cited numbers here, it becomes crystal clear that the total demolition of private homes was not a kind of an exception, but a mass phenomenon across Germany. Just from this preliminary research, the actual figures must have been not just in the thousands, but in the tens of thousands. So the question remains, why did we not more no, know more, not more about the destruction of the Jewish homes? And during my research, I found, I think, three main reasons. The first was serious underreporting in uh, official administrative reports by the police, the stormtroopers, the SS, and also mayors of uh, towns and cities. They usually provided in their reports after the program only um, the numbers for synagogues and shops. In some cases, when homes or the destruction of homes were, uh, was mentioned, the numbers seem to have been sugarcoated. A report, for example, about 14 small towns in the Main region in Western Germany mentioned the destruction of five stores and 53 Jewish homes. We know from other sources that at least one of the mayors only reported four homes instead of the actual nine destroyed uh, homes in his town. The second problem for the authorities was to detect the destruction. While police, yet also journalists and foreign diplomats could easily spot burning synagogues and vandalized shops, especially in the big cities. Vandalized re rental apartments in four-story buildings were often hidden from plain sight, unless, as I just cited in the case of Berlin, uh, furniture was thrown out of the windows. Here uh, uh, is a picture which kind of illustrates this. Uh, in addition, and this is another point, many burnt or demolished apartments were not reported when they were attached to destroyed synagogues, schools, orphanages, and cemeteries, as in Krefeld, Königsberg, Erfurt, Leipzig, and Vienna. The same is true when Jewish homes were located in the back of uh, Jewish stores and businesses. In Düsseldorf, for example, when I mentioned 400 destroyed homes, 60 of them were attached to shops. For example, in Kaiserslautern, a devastated Anna Blüte recalled in a letter after the program how the perpetrators came with iron rods. First, they uh, came to destroy the offices of her business. They cut the telephone line, demolished the desk, and broke the windows. Later, another group appeared, again with iron rods. Now they smashed everything in her living room and the kitchen behind the store. No cup, cup was left unbroken, no windows left intact, as Anna recalled. We were outlaws, she names in the, says in the letter. The third reason for our ignorance is a lack of sources. Until recently, scholars mainly used contemporary police reports, newspaper clippings, but they don't, as I just mentioned, not, they don't talk much about the attacks on homes. However, the video testimonies of the USC Shaw Foundation uh, kind of create a very different or describe a very different reality. Uh, and this is actually how I discovered uh, the topic of the destruction of homes, because when I listen to German Jewish survivors, almost everybody talks about the invasion of their private homes. And they in intriguingly used the same language for the invasion and the destruction. And let me try to share some of the videos with you. time at huge grandfather clock and it struck 
And at that, can you hear the audio? Yes, we, we can hear it. Okay, good. Just to make sure. Moment. It, it sounded like a bomb fell on the house. There was such a terrific noise, and of course now I know what it was. We had iron um, shades on the outside of every window. We were at dinner, it was November 9th, of course, and it was very, very cold, and we were at dinner and there was this horrible noise. It was just unbelievable, like the whole house was falling apart, like a, I would say like a, you know, a bomb was set off. All the windows were being broken and they were knocking down on the door and um, we really didn't know what was happening. And then dad said, you know, we need to get out. We need to get out of the house. What are we going to do? It was night time. You slept already? We were already in bed, yes. What did you hear then? We heard, <laughs> well, we heard the, um, the, there was crashing all around. Obviously something was up and um, the, the banging on the, um, on the gates of the, uh, the, the, the block of flats and uh, poor chap on the first, um, on, the, on the ground floor, Jewish man, um, who, who, opened the, um, who opened the gates for, to let them in, um, he got a good, a good bashing for not opening up, opening up quick enough, you see. So anyway, they bashed him about, about a bit. But he was, you know, he wasn't badly hurt, but nevertheless he'd been, he was bleeding. And um, then gradually, floor by floor, we heard the, uh, the commotion and we knew that we were on the list. Uh, doors and they came in and my father came downstairs ourselves the three of us standing in the hallway again they came by us and started in the kitchen and everything was demolished broken with the, with the axes there was no window left And they go down, they start smashing things, and they start kicking over the stove, and they start smashing things, and they start everything they can. They break everything inside, everything they can possibly find, every chair, every table, every everything they can find. They cut open the feather beds, and they threw the marmalade in, and they threw the milk bottles in, and they, th they took down all the lamps, absolutely. The this gentleman was, who takes my movie now should have taken a picture. In so this is uh, just to give you a short impression uh, how the testimonies are talking about the uh, destruction uh, and the experience, individual experience of the destruction in very uh, similar terms. And uh, these are clips from uh, uh, kind of big cities as well as small kind of villages. So when we have this evidence from uh, the, the variety of places, it is hard to believe that this is just the result of random violence or kind of an extension of the uh, dynamic of violence. We do know that Goebbels told the Nazi party leadership that November night in Munich, that Hitler ordered the demonstration to proceed. But we don't know exactly what he uh, also kind of in detail what he said to the Nazi party leadership. The Vienna Gauleiter Odilo Globocznik noted that Goebbels requested, uh, requested drastic actions in his speech with free range for anybody aiming at the destruction of Jewish property. After the event, and we know this from Goebbels' diary, he drafted a circular at the Nazi propaganda office at night in which he detailed a radical course of action. However, this document has never been found by researchers. But we have some local doc documents which kind of uh, refer to the circular. And they, these documents suggest that Goebbels indeed clearly demanded to demolish the furnishings of Jewish homes. Hence, across Germany, large group of perpetrators, stormtroopers, SS, Hitler youth, and even neighbors roamed villages and towns. Often they operated on lists prepared by the local Nazi party organization or um, as in Trier by the municipality. 
And here I can share some pictures which uh, during the course of my research uh, emerged from various archives, which uh, clearly demonstrate the effects of the violence in private homes. Um, in Weisswasser and Bad Muskau, both small towns in Saxonia, stormtroopers entered several Jewish apartments, hacked with axes the home furnishings into pieces uh, and threw furniture out of windows. In Geldern, near the Dutch border, so on the opposite end of Germany, the SS smashed windows of all Jewish homes, then demolished the interior in such a way that their own report described it as leaving the home furnishings as a waste. In Mechernich, at the Belgian border, stormtroopers vandalized several Jewish houses by smashing windows in China, ripping out power cables and stumping on clothing. Some of them were looting. So while we know now more about the scale of the violence across Germany, let me talk a little bit about the intensity of the violence. The head of the Hannover police reported after the program that in Hannover, the synagogue, the Jewish cemetery, 94 stores and 27 apartments had been demolished. He claimed that in many of the Jewish homes, there was just minor damage to furniture and windows. By contrast, survivors from Hannover reported after the war that their furniture has be, had been systematically hacked to pieces and that in Hannover at a central place, Jewish household goods were even burned in front of a cheering crowd. Everywhere across Germany, similar evidence is mounting, proving the severity of the destruction. In Beuthen, Silesia, the merchant Martin Fröhlich came home in the afternoon of November 10th. He discovered the door of his home was broken. A fallen wardrobe was uh, blocking the doorway. When he entered his apartment, he must wade through knee deep shards and rags. Everything had been smashed to pieces, glass, china, clocks, instruments, furniture, lamps, paintings. Realizing that his flag was inhabitable, Martin Fröhlich felt like hit by a stroke and started crying as he wrote in a letter to his daughter later on. He emphasized that the Nazis had acted worse than vandals. In Gross Auerheim in Hesse, two Jewish homes were vandalized after a speech of the local Nazi party leader. The perpetrators used sledgehammers to destroy everything, including lamps, radios, clocks, furniture. They spilled ink on paintings, rugs, and tablecloths. After the war, still you could find glass and china splinters impressed in the hardwood floor. In camp near Boppard, the attackers broke into the backside of the Kaufman family home, destroyed everything on the ground floor, ripped stovepipes out and broke doors and walls. When parts of the ceiling collapsed, the family escaped and sought shelter in the nearby monastery. And even homes were totally arsoned and burned to the ground at an Euskirchen. The nationwide brutal attacks on private homes did not go unnoticed by foreign observers. The Swiss merchant René Jouvet encountered the home of his Jewish friends in Nuremberg with the door unhinged and water running everywhere. The handrails at the stairs and all doors had been hacked to pieces with axes. Valuable paintings had been cut with knives. The husband and his wife both had been terribly beaten and the man died the next day in the hospital. While most of the foreign diplomats just denounced the attacks on synagogues and stores. The Italian consul general in Innsbruck reported that uh, a gang of thugs with knives and iron poles intruded the apartments of remaining Jewish families, demolished furniture in China and killed five of them. On November 15, the uh, US consul in Stuttgart, Samuel Honecker informed the US ambassador that in his region, the Jews in Rastatt had suffered the most. According to him, many had, beaten by the, uh, had been beaten by the intruders and their apartments had been entirely demolished. Three days after the violent events, the Swiss consul in Cologne reported to his ambassador that in Cologne, organized patrols went from one condominium to another, 
threw belongings out of the windows, gramophones, sewing machines, typewriters. He underlined that bed feathers would still crown bushes and trees three days after the violence. He also mentioned that police sources told him that in Duisburg, not only furniture was pushed through the windows, but also people, which cost three Jews their lives. As the last sources I cited show, the destruction of private homes was frequently accompanied by beatings and murders of their residents. Such physical attacks targeted not just when, but also as survival testimonies reveal many women. And let me share some more pictures of the effects of the violence with you. The physical attacks uh, point to the fact that uh, many of them were only enabled by the intrusion of the private homes. There is a report that in Vienna, more than 1,000 Jews, including women and children, were hurt. In a letter of November 20th, a Jewish woman from Vienna informed a relative, quote, you can't imagine how it looked like at home. Everything ravaged and shattered. When the doctor came to help Papa, Hertha, and Rosa, who all terribly bled from their heads, we had no towel left to wipe off the blood, end of quote. These are, uh, this is a unique series where you, uh, the only series I know where you can actually see the perpetrators in action. This is from Nuremberg. And it matches exactly with the description in testimonies, letters, uh, contemporary reports. And this is also the on, uh, only series where you actually can see victims of the violence. And you see, just imagine uh, the intrusion at, uh, kind of during the night when the people were at sleep in many cases. And then the last photo actually see, uh, shows you the kind of um, the effects of the beatings uh, in this case. So, not only beatings were a kind of common uh, feature of the violence, but also sexual abuse. Uh, we have not uh, so much evidence yet, but uh, the Nazi port party court uh, itself already in 1939 documented four cases of rape and uh, molesting Jewish girls. Um, and not only women were uh, kind of abused. Uh, in Düsseldorf, a Nazi woman's league leader dragged a 70-year-old elderly Jewish man out of his bed to the street. And in front of a cheering crowd, she uh, lifted with a stick his nightgown to show, off his, uh, to show off his genitals. In addition to the murder, uh, to the beatings and sexual violence, murder was common as recorded for various towns and cities all across Germany. In Bremen, Stormtroopers uh, in, uh, invaded the home of Selma Swinitsky and shot her to death in her own bedroom. In Berlin, two stormtroopers beat Willy Wurzeldorf to uh, death in his own apartment on the morning of the November 10th. In Cologne, two men entered the apartment and hair salon of Moritz Spiro. When Spiro tried to stop them to destroy his furniture, one of the intruders beat him over the head and broke his skull. He died several days later in the Jewish hospital. By the way, these kind of uh, beatings, which resulted in really life-threatening injuries, uh, they are not even in, uh, taken into account up to now uh, as kind of uh, murder of Jews for uh, during Kristallnacht. Many of them died several days later, sometimes two weeks later, but they are, uh, they are not in the current count of the uh, vict uh, victims who were killed during the night. So how was the Jewish reaction uh, uh, to the widespread assault of their homes? Thousands, Jews, thousands of Jews became homeless, homeless during, these, um, uh, during the crystal night for two reasons. One was the destruction, which I just described. And another one was uh, that the authorities uh, ordered eviction, their eviction from their homes, as for example, in Vienna, where with, uh, Jews had to leave their homes within three hours. They ended up in the streets without money, 
or any belongings. And the Vienna Jewish community had to organize emergency shelter. For example, 50 people were moved to an educational facility and the head of the Jewish community, Dr. Josef Löwenherz, um, sheltered 15 uh, Jews from neighboring houses in his own apartment, which was uh, kind of overlooked uh, by the violence. In, many, in so many places, the attacks left homes inhabitable. Uh, there were no windows left, no doors anymore in cold November. Um, that as a short-term consequence, countless homeless Jews had to seek shelter either with relatives uh, in the same town. Sometimes they had to go to other towns to find relatives. Sometimes they found shelter with uh, non-Jewish neighbors or even strangers. And there were even uh, reports that they were uh, kind of sheltered by foreign diplomats. For example, the Holzers uh, were driven out of their home in the small town Traunstein in Bavaria. They moved to Munich to live in the, to live in the department, apartment of their relative's family, Anna Neuburg. When Anna Neuburger wrote to her children in the United States who had emigrated earlier, the Holzer family added the postscript to the letter, quote, my loved ones, as you can see, we are still with your mom. Don't worry, she is doing well considering the circumstances. We will remain here until we can return home. Of course, the best thing would be go to America right away, unquote. Other Jewish individuals responded to the violence in more active ways. For example, they documented the brutal vandalism by taking pictures. And uh, the following pictures are taken by Jewish, uh, by Jews um, uh, of their own destroyed apartments and homes. For example, here in Nuremberg, or here in Mannheim. Some Jews actually dared also to criticize uh, the violence in public. For example, in Frankfurt, Henriette Schaefer entered a shop after the violent night and referred to the violence and the attacks against synagogues and shops. When the store owner cited the people's rage as the cause for the violence, Henriette Schaefer snapped and exclaimed, quote, this is not the people, but the government. They are all blackguards, scums and criminals. Hitler is the biggest bandit. If I could, I would poison them all, end of quote. After Kristallnacht, the Vienna Gestapo received a growing number of anonymous letters in which Jews criticized the Führer, Hitler, and the Nazi party. To quote a really striking letter, Dear sweet Gestapo, we will soon beat your ass. Until the German Matres will arrive in our ghetto alley, Hosianna to our Greenspan, the hero boy from Paris. Where now the murder frenzy unfolds, there will soon come, there you will soon come into a big fuss. Gun down the dark, the dark Hitler, end of quote. And during the program, some Jews even resisted physically against the violence. In Lower Saxony, in the small town Peine, SS men destroyed 20 Jewish homes. When they broke into the Marburger family apartment and started beating his father, Hans, a 17 year old, uh, his 17 year old son, tried to fend them off. Unfortunately, the three SS men overwhelmed him. They brought him to the synagogue and there they shot the teenager to death. They then, using a gasoline, set ablaze the synagogue. In another case, 16-year-old Daisy Gronowski from Berlin. She lived in an agricultural training camp uh, during this time where Jewish youth prepared for their immigration to Palestine. Uh, when a gang of stormtroopers raided her uh, camp during Crystal Night. 
she was actually uh, one of the clips I uh, uh, you have seen um, the um, the second to last one with the red uh, blouse. Um, so she described how the, the the facilities were smashed. In her camp after the destruction, the stormtroopers first started to beat up the boys, and then the girls. When the stormtrooper approached Daisy Gronowski, she headbutted the a guy in the stomach, employing a jiu-jitsu trick she had learned in her Berlin Zionist youth group, uh, the Hashomer Hatzair. Using his surprise, she twisted a knife from his hand and stabbed him into his stomach, which made him, made him unconscious. Uh, and to, uh, this situation she could use and uh, escaping into the fields with her friends. So to conclude, as you saw, uh, we have now pictures which actually illustrate uh, the enormous violence uh, and destruction um, of the Jewish homes uh, in so many places across Germany. Most of those photos were taken by the victims to document the crimes and protest of the violence. After the account or preliminary account here presented, um, which is based on a much larger amount of evidence uh, found in administrative reports, letters, diaries, post-war testimonies, I think it is not too far-fetched to claim that the program which was dubbed Kristallnacht and many criticized this, uh, the use of this um, term as too euphemistic, that actually there is much more ring to it now when we take into account not only the shattered shop windows, but the amount of broken glass and china in tens of thousands of Jewish homes. Although the destruction of private homes was not as, uh, not as visible to contemporaries as burning synagogues or looted shops, and therefore was seriously underreported, the attacks were not results of random mob violence. The assaults resulted from direct Goebbels orders and thus were systematic, widespread and severe in their nature. We can only fathom or begin to fathom the enormous psychological and material toll which the violent intrusion took on the Jewish families and individuals. Just think about the fact what people do when they are not even at home and there was a robbery, something to just move out there. How must have been this individual experience of the total destruction, devastation of the homes, the demolition of their furnishings, their personal belongings, and experience, experience at the same time humiliation, beatings, sexual abuse, and sometimes outright murder. The assault on the last refuge for Jews in the Third Reich, their private homes, meant the ultimate loss of remaining, the last remaining security and privacy for so many families. And therefore I think the mass attack on apartments and houses, which rendered thousands of Jews homeless, might uh, help us to explain a little bit better the large number of suicides, the massive flights of Jews from Germany after the program, but also a spike in Jewish resistance and protest. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Wolf, uh, for this lecture um, that sheds uh, so much more light on, on these fateful events of uh, November 1938. Um, I would uh, like to invite our participants, the audience, to post um, uh, their questions through the chat. And uh, while, um, while we do this, maybe I can start asking you uh, a question uh, on something you just mentioned on the term Kristallnacht and how it is um, it is so much uh, connected to shattered glass of shops or the destruction of synagogues and I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about 
the term and the use of the term since in, uh, in, in Germany or in German language, uh, there is an avoidance in using the term Kristallna because it's a term that comes from the Nazi language and the term mostly used in commemorative events or even in lectures that uh, took place today in the German language context, they would use the term Pogromnacht, uh, Pogrom Night. So um, the term Pogromnacht possibly encompasses so much more, right? And also the, the, the evidence that you have shown that, uh, uh, that includes Jewish home. But I would like to ask you to, to reflect on, on the use of the term in both, uh, in both contexts, in English and in German, and the fact that we uh, use the term uh, quite widely, Kristallnacht, uh, here in the, in, in the Anglo world. Yeah, this is my, my questions, and I really invite everyone to, to participate with questions or comments. Yeah, thank you. This is a, a, a really important question. So the history of, uh, use, uh, of the usage of the term uh, starts actually right uh, during the war. Uh, for a long time, we knew that right in 1945, 1946, German newspapers would start commemorate the event uh, using the term Kristallnacht. But we didn't really know where it came from. And for, a time, for some time, uh, people thought my, uh, it may have been actually created by the victims themselves as kind of an ironic term. But now we have evidence that the first time it was used is already in 1939 by um, a Nazi uh, uh, party leader in Mecklenburg uh, during a speech. Uh, so uh, it is actually really a Nazi term. And then from the German newspapers, it kind of uh, went into the English language around 1949. The Times picked it up, uh, then the New York, uh, the London Times, and then the New York Times. And so this is how it came into um, usage in the uh, English speaking world. Um, for a long time in Germany, people would use the public and also the scholars would use Kristallnacht. But then with more um, exploration, investigation, uh, starting in the 1980s, but especially the 1990s, people kind of changed their minds about this term and thought, as I mentioned in the beginning, that this is way too euphemistic for um, uh, the uh, brutal events of the day, of the night and the next day. And so they started to use uh, the ter term November program uh, in, in, uh, and replace Kristallna. Right now, there's also a new discussion going on if program is actually the right term, because program uh, is in a way um, not so much associated with this kind of state orchestrated um, uh, violence as it happened in Germany. So uh, there are, for example, in the book I co-edited, we have ge some Germans proposing one should call it state terror, but this is an ongoing discussion. And I think we can only really think about this when we explore the extent or the actual extent of the violence, which I think only we, uh, we only start to begin to understand. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, we already have uh, several questions um, in the chat. Uh, let me start um, uh, with uh, Brad Griffith's question. Why has it taken so long to document the attacks on Jewish homes during Christiana? Uh, I have to blame myself. Uh, I do Holocaust research, especially on Germany and Austria for now more than 30 years. I kind of uh, investigated in local archives, government archives. And I have to say, I, I read uh, diaries, uh, letter exchanges, and I have over read the mentioning of the destruction of homes. It is mentioned in a lot of published sources, um, but uh, sometimes when you, when you uh, uh, investigate certain topics, we assume certain things as given. As I mentioned in the beginning, we thought this is the best investigated event uh, of the whole Third Reich because there's so much published on Kristallnacht, general studies, local studies. There is so much there that everybody thought we know everything. And I uh, came only across this when I listened to the testimonies of the Shaw Foundation of the survivors. And suddenly it struck me and said, I never heard about this. I never really read about this, which is not true. I just overread it, right? Or I kind of, I neglected it. And so I went back to a lot of documents, which I have kind of uh, uh, already read decades ago. 
and suddenly it pops up everywhere. I looked into my archival copies. Suddenly I find all these reports where this is mentioned. So when you change your perspective, suddenly it opens up a totally new kind of um, field of evidence. And I think in some cases, as I said in the beginning, uh, it is mentioned in local studies, especially during the last 15 years, but there is a problem for the other research, they have the same problem as I have. They don't think about this as a, a big and important part. But for example, there's a huge study about Düsseldorf where I have the number of the 400 uh, destroyed apartments from. So uh, this big study of thousand pages has 24 pages actually dedicated or describing the destruction of Jewish homes. However, the topic of these 24 pages is not the destruction of the homes, it is the looting. So there is a different focus. They, they want to uh, kind of assess what was stolen, what was robbed. So they talk about shops and also homes, but they never really grasp that actually they talk about this uh, kind of widespread violence against the last resort of privacy of the Jews. So they have it there, the evidence, but they don't think about it. And so I think we have to change our perspectives uh, and uh, this will open up, I think, new studies. Um, uh, and also I, I'm kind of, uh, will follow up probably with a small book on this. Thank you, Wolf. I would like to pose the question of Leah Seidman. Uh, she writes, as a teenager, I'm always shocked by the violence of people who could be my peers. What do primary sources say about the participation of Hitler youth or teenagers in general? Good question, yeah. Yeah, this is a very good question. So uh, many sources tell us that uh, uh, Hitler youth was very much involved in, uh, in many places, not in all places, but in many places and uh, in various capacities. For example, we, we already knew that in, uh, before my research, that in Munich, for example, Hitler youth went from apartment to apartment and blackmailed Jewish residents for money. Uh, we uh, know from some village, we knew from some villages uh, via post-war uh, trials that during Kristallnacht, Hitler youth was also participating in the destruction of synagogues, uh, shops, and also homes. So teenagers are involved as part of the Hitler youth, but not in the same kind of organized manner as the stormtroopers, Nazi party members who were kind of orchestrated to do this. They kind of joined in the violence, so to speak. In some cases, there they are kind of also um, uh, are kind of incentivized to join by Nazi party leaders uh, uh, of their local environment. And then you have individual teenagers and sometimes even children who uh, kind of also use the opportunity um, uh, much less into violence, but more into looting, stealing, uh, and sometimes humiliation. Um, our colleague Deborah uh, Peterson Perman at the University of Minnesota Duluth, uh, and also a member of the of the consortium, asks the following question: Whether fo whether photos showing Nazis actively destroying Jewish property used after the war to hold um, identifiable individuals accountable for the crimes were these photos used? The ones you showed. So that's actually a good, very interesting question. First of all. The photos I showed here are the only photos I know uh, which are available right now about the whole destruction. So during Kristallnacht, um, uh, taking photos was actually uh, kind of uh, perpetrated, uh, persecuted. Uh, so I found in police records of Berlin that non-Jews and Jews who took pictures of shops or destroyed apartments were actually arrested. The, the film was taken out of their cameras. Sometimes they lost their cameras. So a lot of the material is actually lost. The, 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 uh, and so in, uh, as far as I know, in most of these post-war trials, there are no photographs of, these, of the destruction. Um, in some cases there might be because I don't, there was a whole range of trial, post-war trials in uh, hundreds and hundreds of small towns in Germany. So uh, this is, I think, a good question for further research to go into these trials and see if there are more photographs. Um, but what I know is that the focus of these trials 
uh, post-war trials was more uh, the um, per, per persecution of uh, beatings, murder, and also attacks on public places like uh, the synagogues, and much less the destruction of homes. This is mentioned in these trials, but they were not specifically kind of persecuted for it in many cases. Um, there's a question by uh, Guy Silverberg uh, about whether you could uh, um, tell us a bit more about the insurance claims and um, whether they could claim many monetary claims uh, for the destruction at all. Uh, that's a good question. And uh, I thought about this. Uh, and I thought uh, they must have asked, for example, the photos, it's not just to document the crime, it is also they could have used the, the photographs to kind of go uh, and ask for insurance um, kind of payments. Uh, but there is this general kind of policy after the uh, Kristallnacht that um, insurances had to pay, but not to the victims. And uh, so that's the, uh, I think the gen general policies. However, uh, I uh, kind of checked the available literature about insurance companies uh, and how they dealt with insurance claims um, of the program. Homes are not mentioned there. It's, the whole focus is on shops, businesses, uh, and uh, kind of uh, institutions. So I think this is another kind of avenue we have to go into to the future to actually really research, especially probably in local uh, kind of uh, smaller insurance companies where I think we might find claims even if they are, they are not kind of honored, uh, but uh, we might fi uh, find much more than. What I know is that um, after the war, there were uh, 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 survivor families actually uh, uh, filed uh, recompensation claims uh, uh, and uh, often provided lists of the destroyed kind of goods in their homes. Um, and so after the war, there was a lot of this and there's a lot of material which we uh, really first have to explore, which never has been done on a larger scale. And I think this will also change our picture a lot. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, there is a question um, posed by Joachim Savelsberg, uh, my friend and colleague in the sociology yeah, department. I remember. Uh, and you will see, uh, Wolf, that this is a very sociological question. Uh, and it's the following. Do uh, your data allow you to identify patterns of destruction by region of the country, by city versus small town, by religious affiliation, intermarriage of the victims and such? And if so, do these patterns move us towards explanations of the intensity of the violence? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, first of all, I have to say, this is a kind of, uh, I'm a one man show here. So <laughs> my capacity is limited. And um, what I did is really first a survey, kind of where can I find evidence for this? Um, what I saw from this evidence there is not much of a difference between small villages and big towns. I was assuming this because the older literature always told us that the um, kind of intimate violence on in smaller towns was so much more grave than um, in big cities where Jews often fled to because they hoped for more anonymity, uh, anonymity there. But I can't see this. I mean, the destruction in some of these cities like Nuremberg, Düsseldorf, was so kind of widespread and, um, and systematic that I don't see much of a difference between small villages uh, and big, um, uh, big towns here. But I think this is really also up to future research where we need to have much more data because although I could kind of present um, a survey here, this is still anecdotal uh, uh, data, which I kind of found uh, in a huge variety of sources. And we have now to do kind of these deep dives into certain places and uh, to really see how does this work out in certain places. Because when I have a, um, a police report, for example, from Leipzig, of Leipzig, which I didn't mention in my talk, and I know in Leipzig, they talk about 34, apartments destroyed, which is for a huge city like Leipzig, almost nothing. But then I have some survivor testimonies talking about arsoning of buildings. And so we have similar, like Hannover, very different claims. And so we need to do local deep dives in 
what actually happened on the ground in these uh, cities. And then I think we have a chance to compare. Can I, can I ask a follow up to that? Uh, so, so far you haven't identified any patterns, but this in terms of destruction of homes uh, only or other uh, general patterns regarding the destruction of, um, of businesses and, uh, and, and synagogues. And I'm saying that because um, just this is obviously anecdotal evidence because that it's uh, very close to, to, to my heart because my father always tells he's from Pirmasen, it's a small town in the oh. Latinate. And um, um, he, he was five years old at the time and he tells how a friend of his father who was connected to the local city government uh, remind, uh, um, warned um, the Jewish community about uh, the attack and asked um, and, and told them so that so they could save the Torah scrolls from the from one of the local synagogues. So I wonder if I mean my father always explains that as uh, saying because this was a small town everybody knew each other and uh, the, even the, the, the local authorities weren't in agreement with, with, with the, the, the directions that were coming from Berlin. Now I don't know this is not my area of research whether that uh, there's this is only this specific case or you have come across um, similar other cases in your research. So there are two answers uh, to this question. The one is, uh, uh, I don't think this was the whole kind of uh, reaction of the whole city administration. It might have been one official um, uh, uh, who kind of really in a way resisted uh, kind of the, uh, the official orders. Um, because what we usually forget is that how complex uh, the interest, personal interest, uh, institutional interest were in one place. Um, party, city government, uh, individual people in these institutions, and they all reacted differently. And so what I think what my kind of research uh, also reveals, and this is the second uh, answer to this question, is on a large scale, on the one hand, we see this enormous and almost kind of uh, unfathomable um, uh, scale of violence. Uh, but we also see acts of solidarity in a larger scale than we expected. I kind of uh, mentioned in side remarks how non-Jews shelter Jews, right? This is very common, by the way. It's not like there are only one or two cases. So um, uh, non-Jews uh, shelter Jews, um, non-Jews offered help, non-Jews protested in public against the violence. So I found in police records arrest of non-Jews who protested against the violence, against the program. So you have, a, on the one hand, more a kind of more perpetrators than we previously thought, but on the other hand, we have also more people who kind of were in opposition, who helped Jews than we previously uh, kind of thought. Thank you, Wolf. Maybe we can uh, take one more question from, from the chat. And there's uh, one that um, it is uh, Neil Gail who asked about the um, Austrian Jews and whether they were, um, whether they suffered the same fate of the, of the November pogrom. Um, we know they did, but are there differences uh, between Austria and Germany and maybe also the, the Sudetenland, which was also affected? Yeah, so um, uh, in a way, all annexed territories were affected by uh, the violence. In Austria, it is a little bit more specific because most of the Jews in Austria lived uh, anyway concentrated in Vienna. So Vienna is practically the hotspot. Interesting is uh, th there are some smaller differences. On the one hand, there is much more decentralized uh, kind of um, orders. So Globochnik, which I mentioned, whom I mentioned in the, uh, the kind of when he noted Goebbels' orders, he also notes that he uh, did things differently than uh, uh, ordered. So he in, in Vienna, we know there is much more blackmailing um, uh, than in other cities, as as far as I come came across the evidence. There is um, there might have been a little bit less destruction, but more cases of arsoning. Interestingly. 
So there are differences, but I think also these differences need to be kind of validated by more research than uh, because I'm a little bit hesitant to kind of uh, uh, draw from my um, from the evidence I have there. Thank you. So um, uh, I want to, to thank you again, Wolf, and uh, we for, for honoring us with this lecture on this uh, important evening at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and in partnership with, with JCRC and other organizations, we always think of commemorations as an opportunity to learn and also to make connections between past and present. So with that, um, I, I, I would leave it and I would also turn it over again to, to my friend uh, Steve Hanex, uh, maybe for some closing words. I want to thank everyone for, for attending and for the excellent questions. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Wolf. Thank you all that attended and participated tonight. This discussion about the semantics of Kristallnacht got me thinking. And uh, I never fully appreciated that we were perhaps inadvertently expropriated that term, which was, of course, uh, a euphemism for what happened that night and a German euphemism for what happened that night. And it makes me reflect upon, I had the great good fortune of uh, being attending the University of Warwick for a year on a study program abroad in Coventry, outside of Coventry in England. And I had a professor, Professor Lionel Cochin, who was one of the great figures of Anglo-Jewish history. And his book about the Kristallnacht was called 9-11-1938, pogrom, colon, pogrom. And I had never thought about that before. So obviously, many years ago, when professor, when professor Cochin wrote his book, he was being very careful about the term that he chose to describe the Kristallnacht as pogrom. So all these years later, thanks to what Wolf was saying, I finally came to that, finally came to that realization, a little bit of an epiphany tonight about uh, the way Professor Narcochin described that night. So thank you. We should always continually learn and even revisit old thinking and uh, books and documents and ideas that perhaps we hadn't thought about before. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all.